in addition to my work at Music Canada, I'm a huge, huge booster of the chamber movement. I'm actually the treasurer now, just this last weekend, uh, of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. So uh, I, uh, I'm a big supporter of that movement. It gets me into a lot of different uh, cities in the province, which I love uh, traveling around to. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's great to see uh, that the chamber's here. Uh, Sylvia, thank you. Uh, I just got to say that um, we first, where did you go? Oh, we first bumped into one another at, um, uh, at Canadian Music Week when I, this was uh, shown to me and I was uh, blown away. I'll come back to that, uh, just how far ahead of, I think, a lot of other centres you are, thanks to Sylvia and your, your City Council and so forth. And then, um, Earl, you mentioned uh, music, uh, money for musicians. And uh, I think sometimes in a lot of our advocacy, we forget that at the root of this, we are trying to make an environment where musicians can make money like everybody else and be professionals and aspire and grow in the way the rest of us do. And right now, it's not that easy for them. So I applaud you for directing your attention to that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with with, uh, with that at all. I think it's, it's, it's certainly at the heart of a lot of what we do. So, um, this is me, obviously, um, and our report, The Next Big Bang, I see that many of you have it. It was, I think, put out at the front there. You can uh, follow us uh, on uh, uh, Twitter, of course, and, uh, and Facebook as well. Uh, and uh, both Music Canada and, uh, and my account are, are good places to go to get uh, information. We're constantly providing a, a steady stream of that. Um, so today's predominant focus uh, at all levels uh, is, I think, jobs. That's not surprising. And uh, so from our perspective, when we uh, sat down a couple years ago and thought out, okay, how are we going to, how are we going to change this narrative? Um, you know, we had to think what language are they speaking uh, and speak it to them. And the language really is, is jobs and the economy, not surprisingly. Now we represent, as you know, Music Canada, the commercial music industry. It's a community that's made up of large and small businesses. Uh, but even our large businesses are not that large. Uh, Universal Music, largest record company in the world, now has maybe 130 employees in Canada. So, you know, these are not monolithic, huge enterprises. Uh, and I think that uh, too often uh, music tends uh, to be viewed through the lens of culture exclusively uh, and I think that can be distracting uh, and that's why uh, your Music Works program I think is uh, so uh, far uh, ahead of its time because uh, you frame music the way I think it needs to be framed which is as an economic driver or an economic cluster. Um, it isn't that we don't produce cultural artifacts and things, we do but there's an economic dimension to it. Uh, and uh, when uh, governments at all levels are concerned about jobs and the economy, uh, we can take this message to them that music can help. And in fact, in, 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 uh, in, in, I often challenge people that I'm talking to, uh, no matter what the environment, <clears throat> to come and think of a, an, a, some, a problem that music can't help with. And it's actually difficult to think what that problem might be maybe picking up your dog's poop, although it might make, if you were listening to music, that might make it easier to do, I don't know. See what I mean? There's always, oh yeah, you could, it does help. Uh, so, um, politicians are taking notice of this, uh, this reframing. Uh, for example, Minister Moore, uh, he understands the importance of uh, music, um, a federal uh, 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 Minister of Heritage, uh, and uh, this is the prime reason why he asked us at Music Canada to organize his music nights on the hill so that we can bring this point home to his colleagues. Now, um, this is actually quite an innovative thing that he's done, uh, where he uh, we uh, program an event at the National Arts Centre, um, and we've done three, and only three so far, uh, and we get three, the, the, the focus of the audience, it's not a paid event, uh, it's exclusively focused on politicians and staffers and senior bureaucrats. 
and uh, we get them all together and we've, uh, we, we partner with Quebec Or, so there's a Quebec artist and there's an Anglo artist, and we've put uh, Jim Cuddy, uh, Johnny Reed, uh, and uh, uh, Sheepdogs uh, in front of these enthusiastic audiences, Carqua. Uh, actually, the Carqua show, I thought the place was going to go mental. Uh, it was great. They, we, we'd been told that they didn't have, they couldn't do an encore, but they, MPs weren't leaving. So, uh, and I think there was a vote. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> uh, it was, it's been terrific, um, but it, it goes to show what, he's try what, what Minister Moore is trying to say to people is, you know, music matters. Think about music. Uh, so, um, provincially too, as you're probably aware, um, there was a groundbreaking announcement last week uh, at Lee's Palace. Uh, there's a picture of Kitchener's own Courage, My Love. Uh, now, what, what is this, just in a nutshell? Um, we'd been advocating passionately uh, with the provincial government to recognize music as something distinct, something different, showing that music can help in all these different areas. Uh, and guess what? They agree. And uh, interestingly, uh, probably the first time in history uh, during the leadership uh, debates, uh, music was a topic. Sandra Popatello and, uh, and Kathleen Wynne both debated one another on, or not, not that they were disagreeing, on the importance of music to the economy. Uh, and uh, that's bled over into uh, uh, Ms. Wynne's, uh, the Premier's administration, because uh, she mentioned it in her throne speech, she mentioned it in the Liberal Heritage uh, dinner speech, uh, and now it's in the budget. Uh, so, uh, a little bit about this event that you're going to see. Uh, this was a pre-budget announcement. Uh, you're probably uh, um, the fact that just I should say the fact that music is in a budget. I think that's the first time that's ever happened. So this is huge, and the fact that uh, it was selected as a pre-budget announcement. So we we kicked off on Wednesday morning at Lee's at 9 a.m. with ministers Souza and Chan uh, and uh, to make this announcement. Um, and uh, if you've been to Lee's Palace, you'll know it's about 350 people, absolutely packed to the gills. Uh, in fact, there was a lineup out the door. People were pointing out that it was probably the first time Lee's had ever had a lineup at 9 a.m. Uh, so what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to show you. Uh, we we can uh, uh, we've got a little clip. It's about eight minutes long of that event, and I think it's worth just sitting and watching. Thank you, Graham, and thank you all of you. I can't get over the fact this place is packed at 9 o'clock in the morning here at Lee's Palace. And uh, really, you all should be going home around this time. <laughs> Listen, what a great band. I love this. I love the young people that are involved. It's part of why we're doing this. What we're doing is trying to stimulate more engagement and promote our arts and culture. In Ontario, we have so much to offer. And I've seen a lot of bands in my day, 
and uh, I've participated in a number of productions and so forth, and it gives me such a thrill and such, a, um, and such great enthusiasm to see the business of music thrive. And that's what we're talking about today. We're also talking about numbers. I'm, I'm the finance minister. I got a budget to put forward. I got to ensure that we stimulate economic growth. There's no better way to stimulate economic growth than jobs than supporting the music industry right here in Ontario. You look around North America, we got some pretty hefty cities doing some good stuff in the music industry, in the recording industry, and in the productions, and in the distribution, and in the nurturing of our talent. You don't have to go to LA or New York, you can do it right here in Toronto, because boy, we got 80% of the market of, in Canada right here in Ontario, and you guys are it. Because this is what's going to make us a prosperous Ontario. It's also about our society. We want to ensure economic renewal. We want to ensure manufacturing. We want to encourage even more production of all kinds of supplies and goods. But we also want to promote a fair society. This budget is going to talk about two issues, how to create jobs and growth, how to be fair so as to allow everybody that opportunity to succeed, and more importantly, we have to balance our books. We have to eliminate our deficit in a timely manner. That's what we're going to be doing. And above all, we got to help create jobs. This fund, and we're going to announce, and we are announcing today, $45 million to the music industry. And this is going to be money well spent because the ripple effect of this investment of these grants are going to enable us to attract more productions, more talent here in Ontario. We're going to, we want, we know that the production facilities and, and, and the ability to do both live music as well as digital and recording can occur in a big way in Ontario. So these additional monies that are being presented, that are being provided, are going to build on the strong foundation that you've, you've, already, that you've already established. It's going to enable us to use it as a platform to succeed in many other respects. It's going to develop jobs. It's going to enable our young people to be even more involved and staying at home to get it done. It's going to attract people from all over the world to want to come to Ontario. And it's going to make us an even more dynamic and vibrant province. Folks, I'm so proud of the work that you're doing. I'm really impressed that you're here this early in the morning. <laughs> Folks, Ontario's music scene as an incubator of our talents, home to world-renowned artists, and a diversity of music style, Ontario has everything it takes to become a top live music destination, not just in Canada, not just in North America, but around the world. This is the vision of our government through our long... Good morning, folks. Did we ever think we'd see a day like this? <laughs> An announcement like this? I'm, I'm speechless. Yeah. About to give a speech and I'm speechless. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here as a musician, also as a member of the Mississauga business community, Charles. Ooh. And uh, <laughs> part, of the, part of the Canadian music industry. And I want to say, on behalf of everybody in this room, who are, as you mentioned, here at 9 in the morning, wow, thank you. Thank you. Wow. It takes people like Minister Souza and Minister Chan to make things happen. And uh, Graham, I know you'll agree, uh, it's just, it's incredible, really, what you folks have done. And uh, the gratitude in this room, I can tell you, is right from the heart. Thank you. This is an amazing moment in the music industry here in Canada. Now, in our industry, uh, as we all know, when you produce a hit, you get recognized with a gold record. <laughs> so, ministers, you've nailed it. <laughs> uh,
I'm not used to being up this early. Okay, in honor of what this means for everyone in this room, uh, I feel like, you know, with the recession that everyone survived and we are finding our way, we're pretty much we're in the thick of it. And I think if we uh, do all this together, we can find a very prosperous future. So I'm hoping you guys will clap along to this song. It's very short, two and a half minutes. I know anything longer, you'd never do it. So <laughs> this is it. Everybody, reporters to him. have in your hands, uh, which is gratifying, of course, to us because it's something that benefits the broader ecosystem uh, from live music, uh, we hope music education, uh, digital, uh, and so forth. Uh, so we look forward to a consultation process, uh, which is uh, just getting underway now to sort of decide exactly what the parameters of that fund are going to be. Uh, <clears throat> But um, before we come back to it, what I wanted to do was sort of put all of this into the context of, uh, you know, where, where the music sector is now. Uh, this year, uh, we announced that uh, revenues, uh, global revenues from music for the fir increased for the first time in, in 30, 13 years. Uh, now, I don't think there is a sector uh, that has experienced the consequences of the digital revolution more directly and maybe more punitively uh, than has the music community. Uh, the entire ecosystem has been disrupted. Uh, now the community, I believe, has embraced the challenge. Uh, adaptation was necessary, but it was not always easy. And the process of transformation is by no means over. Uh, a $38 billion market worldwide has become a $16 billion market. Uh, in Canada, it was 1.4 billion, and now it's 400 million or less. Uh, that's a billion dollars missing, and it didn't just disappear, and it didn't come back in any other way, at least not yet. But this year, for the first time, uh, we've seen an increase in the size of the market. It's a small one, uh, but an increase nonetheless. But digital revenues, while increasing, have not made up for the massive losses uh, that we've uh, experienced. Uh, I love this quote from Robert Levine. He wrote a book called Free Ride, a uh, former editor of Billboard. Uh, he says, it's never been easier to distribute a creative work. Uh, at the same time, it's never been harder to get paid for it. And that kind of sums it up. While there are more licensed services in Canada now uh, than ever before, there's 13 new ones in 2011 and 12 alone, uh, it remains difficult for consumers to know if they are accessing music from sources that actually pay recording artists. And I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, last August, Google proudly announced uh, that they were adjusting their algorithm so that legitimate sources of music would bubble closer to the top. Now imagine if, for a second, you worked for Black & Decker and sold toasters and Google told you that, you know, we're going to work to make sure that legitimate Black & Decker product is on page one. Uh, and we have to, they would never put up with that. We, for some reason, do. So we thought, okay, well, we'll take them at their word. Google is, uh, they, they're, they're the do no evil company. So I'm sure they're good as their word. And so we did a test last fall to see what a consumer would have to do 
to find Carly Rae Jepsen, Jepsen's song, uh, Call Me Maybe, if they typed in Carly Rae Jepsen download. And what we found was the first legitimate source was on page 10. Who the hell goes to page 10? Who goes to page two of a Google search? So they're not making it easy, but they said they were gonna make it better. Unfortunately, as of last March, Carly Rae is probably on page eight or nine or 10. So either they didn't mean what they said or they're not very good at adjusting algorithms. Uh, but one way or the other, it's bad news for musicians. Um, now, music discovery also has moved online. Um, and uh, there's a lot of data up here on this page. It's all from our document, but what does it say? Well, it basically says that young people, not surprisingly, if anybody's got a 10 or 12 year old, like I do, uh, they're using new ways to discover new music and it's not necessarily the old ways. Um, and I think that we need to start planning uh, for a world in which people discover music in new, new Canadian music in different ways. We've relied for decades on one strategy uh, that is, and it was very successful, and it was to expose Canadians to Canadian music on radio. The audience is moving, and are we following it? And this is a challenge to policymakers. Another feature of the modern ecosystem is that as sales of music have died away as an important income stream for artists, live performances become ever more important. Now this is a double-edged sword. Any, all of you touring artists will know this. This is a double-edged sword. Uh, if the only way you can make money is touring, uh, then you don't have a diversified portfolio. And of course, the great thing about the old days was that there was a diversified portfolio. You did a bit of this, you did a bit of that. There was songwriting, there was radio play, there was sale, selling things. It wasn't just performing. But we have to recognize that it is what it is. And so, uh, given that it's become a staple income for, or the staple income for most musicians, um, we have to think of ways that we can improve the market for live music. And you'll know that most governments don't sort of think about that. Um, so we've been through tough times. Uh, for our part, um, my members, Universal, Sony, EMI, and our friends in the domestic independent market, um, you know, we've, we've, we're coming out of them maybe, uh, but we're still faced with a hard reality that we have to get paid. Uh, discovery moves online, live performance is more important than ever, but one thing hasn't changed and that is our commitment uh, to, uh, to developing artists, uh, despite an awful lot of propaganda in the media to the contrary. Uh, and interestingly, um, did a study recently uh, internationally. One of the things that we uh, is is uh, is is quite popular in the media is that artists don't want labels. They want to do it DIY, do it themselves. And believe me, over the years I've worked with many many artists who uh, were in fact pioneers of the do-it-yourself. Uh, but Anne, we know that, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, this is not foreign to me. But the idea that everybody wants to do that is actually not quite correct. And when asked. Um, you know, artists do want to have a recording contract of some sort or another because they don't want to do it all themselves. And when asked what it is they want help with, interestingly, it's marketing and promotion. So we thought, let's take a deep dive into what this new world might look like and how we might restructure it. And the product is in your hands, uh, the next big bang. And we identified five critical areas, uh, music education, uh, digital innovation, music tourism, export expansion, and integrated tax credits. So our first area of exploration we think is nothing short of a game changer. Um, Chili Gonzalez, uh, Feist's producer, has said that if we want to raise the bar, then this is the way to do it, uh, music education. And we think he's right. Our research regarding music education is being led by the Information and Communications Technology Council in Ottawa, a national think tank that's focused on technology, innovation, skills. And working from a shared intuition that we had with them, uh, we think we're laboring in some fresh fields here. We've engaged ICTC uh, to look at two distinct areas, the connection between music education and a skilled and technically savvy workforce, 
and the correlation between music scenes and tech clusters. And I think that if we think about Kitchener, when I'm talking about this, we can see why it's a very, very interesting community in this regard. So let's start with music education. Um, this uh, Monday, I was at one of the most incredible events I've ever been at. It's uh, uh, Music Monday, uh, and it's run by, organized by uh, Music Makes Us, which is a coalition to support music education by music educators. And uh, there was a link to Commander Hatfield as he went over in his, uh, in his uh, space station. Uh, and they led hundreds of thousands of students all across the country uh, in the performance of a song uh, written by Commander Hatfield and Ed Robertson of the Bare Naked Ladies called Is Somebody Singing. Uh, we could see him on the big screen uh, and he starts playing and then everybody kind of reclaimed. Now everybody starts singing. It was pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Um, and then in no uncertain terms, the guitar goes down or floats rather, it doesn't go down, he puts it floating around and he starts talking about the importance of music education. This, by the way, right on top of a meeting by the Toronto District Friggin School Board that wants to cut music education. Right, he's right up there and there's hundreds of thousands of us singing and they're meeting the next bloody night to cut it. Anyway, talk about being disconnected and tone deaf. That's right, save money by cutting teachers. Um, anyway, he says, talking about music education, it opens doors, it wires your brain, music makes me a better astronaut. Uh, he says, I need to be creative, innovative, uh, create a symphony of things in the space station. It was great, all sorts of terrific quotes. Uh, we also uh, know that he's not the only person of distinction to trace his training in music to a successful career. This is Bill Clinton uh, who says, I think it is very unlikely that I would have ever become president uh, had I not been involved in school music from the time I was nine until the time I was 17. So we're doing our study with ICTC. The Preliminary results are in our report. They found that music education builds student success. Now there is a mountain of this evidence. It's not just here, a mountain of it. Take note, Toronto District School Board. And here are just a few findings of the research uh, about the benefits. Self-esteem, respect, higher test scores, improved memory, critical thinking, spatial reasoning, engagement. We also believe that music education can help restore some of the respect that has been lost for the creator. And believe me, out there, there has been a loss of respect for the creator. And let's not forget that one of the benefits of music education is that it often begins a lifelong appreciation of music. Everyone, including people with important decision-making roles, is a music fan. Minister Souza plays the piano. Prime Minister Har uh, Harper has a drum kit, piano, bass, guitar, guitar in the main room in 24 Sussex permanently and jams all the time. They are fans of music. Practically everybody is. They're just two examples of many. But in music education, the situation is almost desperate and frankly ridiculous. Uh, music teachers are all among the first who are cut and schools often satisfy core curriculum by showing students movies. I know my son Ed has been subjected to that. Um, so governments are going to have to step up at some point um, because this isn't just about music, it's about all of us. Uh, now ICTC has also looked at something else, the connection between music scenes and tech clusters. Now think Kitchener. Vibrant music scenes are magnets for creative and innovative people and the companies that employ them. Uh, Austin, Texas, has stated the connection in their impact, economic impact study, noting that creativity and culture impact business recruitment, retention, expansion, and entrepreneurship. We took a delegation from Toronto to Austin this uh, spring, and we went and met Austin Chamber of Commerce President Mike Rollins. Put him in front of him, and asked Mike some questions. How do you use music? Why is music important to the Austin Chamber of Commerce? To him, he said it's an asset. It's a hook to get people to come to Austin. 
He said, and I quote, they know Austin is music and we get to capitalize on that. Every single pitch Austin makes to businesses that are looking to relocate, every single pitch includes their fantastic live music scene. And they will tell you that they have major businesses relocating to Austin because of that. And Governor Rick Perry told us in a parallel meeting that the reason the F1 is situated outside Austin has a hell of a lot to do with their music scene. So clearly it's working there. Austin's Mayor Lee Leffingwell also told us that Austin was the last into their recession and the first out of their recession. And he said it was directly connected with the creative community and music in particular. And obviously this is something you share in Kitchener. And I know that Sylvia uh, has uh, used our Austin Toronto research uh, to build on her own research, which was parallel to and independent of ours. It's extraordinary uh, to show that there are similarities here. Uh, <clears throat> now, our study did not look at Kitchener-Waterloo, I'm sorry, uh, but it did focus on Toronto and, uh, and, Kitch uh, and uh, Montreal uh, and started to draw. Now, there's a much bigger piece coming out. This was just what you've got is kind of preliminary. Uh, Jeff Leeper, who's the Chief Policy Advisor of ICTC, and he authored this section, had this to say about the findings here. Uh, music and technology are, in our views, inextricably linked. Tech jobs today require discipline and logical thinking, as well as creativity and an ability to innovate on the basis of strategic thinking. Music education and a lifelong involvement with music made possible in cities with strong scenes, Kitchen or Waterloo, could be Canada's competitive advantage. Educators, parents, policymakers, and business leaders concerned with Canadian economic prosperity should consider the role music might play as a global competitive advantage. Second area uh, is digital innovation. <clears throat> and clearly, in order to successfully evolve, we're going to, uh, from analog to digital, uh, we're going to have to embrace technology and use it to our benefit because we're all familiar with the other side of that coin. Quote here from Jeffrey uh, Immelt, uh, Chair of General Electric, the only reason to invest in companies of the future is their ability to innovate, to differentiate. Well, that's what we have to do. We have to constantly innovate, which is to say generate commercial success from knowledge and ideas. That's innovation. And therefore, we are calling on our funding programs and policy framework uh, to reward and stimulate innovation. Uh, it should be the goal of funding agencies to encourage and reward innovations that, that fundamentally improve core business functions, the chances for creator success, and fan discovery. We lost an absolutely gigantic opportunity in Canada to have a Canadian-owned digital distribution system. It was called Pure Tracks. When I was at Universal, Universal we pumped a million dollars of seed capital into Pure Tracks. It went to the Canadian government, Department of Heritage, begged for money and was told, we have no money for you, we only fund the production of masters. Now, only if you are from the film industry, you will know that the holy grail is Canadian-owned distribution. We had it, we built it, they wouldn't fund it, it died. And today we have, and we love them, iTunes, and they are 90% plus of the market. So, we have another problem though. Uh, as we move to these new models, it comes back to what uh, Earl was talking about. Can musicians make money from this? Can they be professionals? Well, here's an example of an exchange I got involved in with Grizzly Bear, one of the big indie bands. Uh, this is one of the horror stories that we hear a lot about. Uh, in effect, one CD sale being worth more to Grizzly Bear than 300,000 streams on Pandora. Uh, that's a problem. How are we going to fix that? Uh, similarly, virtually all of our digital providers, retailers, are now foreign-owned. That's new. How are we going to deal with that? Um, I think Martin here has a great quote that technology companies should be partners of rights companies. Martin runs Beggar's Group, one of, Beggar's, one of the biggest independent labels in the world. Not their masters. 
Our partnership with them are fundamental to our business now, and we were talking about content earlier, uh, as our content is to theirs. Uh, music tourism. This is the third area. Um, I think of this as our hidden, Ontario's hidden, unused superpower. Uh, it's our live music scene. It represents enormous latent potential to boost our economy through the enhancement of uh, one of our most important economic sectors, tourism. Um, and uh, if I had to um, give you an example, I give you examples again, Austin, Seattle and Nashville who've built strong city brands around their uh, music economy uh, and uh, have figured out how to harness it. Uh, and yet at no point in our province's history have we ever systematically and comprehensively tapped into this potential to encourage not tourism in general, but music tourism in particular. And tourism is important today because, at least in Ontario and I suspect across the country, uh, it's the largest single employer of young people. Um, arts and culture tourists, very interesting subgroup. This is a study done by the Ontario Arts Council. In a nutshell, it's a huge economic, uh, it's a huge tourism uh, motivator. And arts and culture tourists stay longer, spend more, and of the arts and culture tourists, which is a huge chunk of people who come to Ontario, music predominates. And that's without a plan. Imagine what we could do if we had a plan which is what led us to this report. Now, it says accelerating music industry's growth, right? And it, Toronto's music industry growth, you could basically take out Toronto, right in Kitchener, Waterloo, London, Guelph, anywhere, and I guarantee you that the recommendations in that report apply to your city if you have a music scene. Why is Austin a great example to follow? It's about a third the size of Toronto. However, its commercial industry generates about $1.6 billion in economic impact, which is roughly three times what our industry generates. And music tourism accounts for nearly half of that. Local organization on this front is extremely important. And it will help you benefit from the province's live music strategy, which has also just been announced and which is part of the Ontario Music Fund. And Minister Chan, his objective is to make Ontario one of the global destinations for live music tourism. And he set up a working group. Uh, Sylvia, I hope you're going to be part of that. Uh, and uh, our first goal is to generate a one-stop shop for people to learn about live music events in Ontario. Uh, sort of it's an online portal. It may be the first of its kind in the world. Uh, I'm going to touch briefly on export and then I'm going to skip the tax credit piece because it's kind of irrelevant now but our fourth area so this will be the last discussion point <clears throat> was export expansion you know when I first started uh, representing artists uh, late 80s early 90s uh, you could have a career in Canada and only Canada and have a great career uh, today uh, because uh, the crunch uh, sales crunch and so forth uh, if you're not global uh, it's very very difficult so we need to find a way to help musicians uh, make that transition and export development, export expansion is a key part of that. Uh, it's also a key part because internationally, Brand Canada, if you think about what our brand is, yes, it has a lot to do with RIM, but really, actually, if you start asking people internationally, it's musicians that they think about as being Canadian. Just some examples of some uh, export funding opportunities uh, around the world uh, and our own that you'll find in our, uh, in our book, in our published paper. Now, I am going to skip over tax credits. Do, do, do. Those are the five opportunities. Uh, leave you sort of with uh, the, the, the um, thoughts about uh, this and what it means. Uh, we're not 100% sure, although again, as I said, the, the government now intends to uh, consult with us. Uh, written consultations are welcome. They will be reaching out into the communities. Uh, but I believe that the government's got it right. I believe they've responded to uh, the Big Bang and other representations that have been made. But at the foundation of it all is an understanding and a growing awareness that music can help 
But one other thing, and you can't quite see it in this photo. Did you notice what was written on the podium uh, that Minister Souza was speaking from? The words were, music means jobs. That is a sea change. And we carefully evolved their thinking from our music can help hashtag and that was when we unveiled, we got, we said, they said, we want to put something. We'll put the words, music means jobs. And so they did, and that's where we are. So th that's my presentation for today. Thanks very much, Sylvia. And uh, I'm actually joined by four councillors just to give you a sense of the interest that uh, is there within this community and on this council specifically. Councillors Bill Ioannidis, Perry Kibanovich, Dan Glenn Graham and Yvonne Fernandez. So we almost make up a quorum. <laughs> We're one short, unless I miss somebody. We could make some decisions right here. Uh, do it. So, all, I mean, I started out by saying, wow. I'm pumped, and I haven't been here for the entire presentation, unfortunately. Uh, the possibilities are absolutely um, outstanding. Graham, uh, you've uh, presented some of the, the challenges that we have, but such exciting opportunities uh, and so much to talk about uh, in, in, this, in this field. Uh, the City of Kitchener, this community at, at, as a whole, has been at the forefront of uh, a lot of things and in some cases we we like to think or we delude ourselves to say that we're the ahead of the curve uh, but it's something in the history of this community we just finished celebrating we are finishing celebrating the hundredth anniversary of kitchener as a city and when i was doing some research last year for that centennial um, came up with a whole array of things where they were Kitchener firsts. The first this, first that, and you go right through, across the spectrum, whether it was the industry, the culture, or whether it was in education. And one of the things that just simply comes to mind, you know, going back to the 1800s and uh, the early 1900s, uh, the Sanger Fest, which is, was, music was the core of this community. And in fact, it's, it still continues. I personally had an interest in music all of my life. And uh, I remember as a, a kid in, in public school, going to the uh, uh, singing in the Kiwanis Music Festival, it's still going today. There are hundreds of kids. There was a story in today's paper, I think it was, or yesterday's. Hundreds of, of kids who are the potential uh, budding musicians, whether it's uh, going to be in the uh, with, with a, an instrument, composing, voice, whatever it happens to be. And you were rejected. Well, I actually ha I composed one song in my life in high school, and it got sung once, and so uh, that's my claim to fame. Well, the, the next big bang, I don't know of any reason why it can't happen right here uh, in Kitchener and Waterloo region. Uh, Bob Egan uh, was, uh, did a video clip for us in the State of the City Address back in April, and he ended off his comments by saying, Kitchener rocks. And so I simply say, look out Austin and all of the other uh, music uh, cities around uh, North America in particular. This is such a huge industry. You've talked a little bit about it, of course, and we know some other anecdotal uh, comments. Um, I think we can be a major player uh, in this field if we believe in ourselves. And when I look at the, uh, in this room right now, and knowing some of you, and what you are already doing, you know you believe in yourself. And we, uh, as collectively then, have to do what's also the history of this community, and that is cooperation and collaboration. And with all of that, we will ensure that music works and music works well in this community, and we can be that beacon of not only Canada, Ontario and Canada, but of North America and the world. And so great thanks go to Sylvia and others who have been uh, pushing for this cluster and actually putting some meat on the bones 
for this cluster as it develops. So I'm really pleased to have had uh, this opportunity to be here. Glad that you are here today, but the work uh, just begins, and so best wishes to all of you. Thanks very much.